Let me go backwards here where I was. Okay, so <clears throat> so what are the uh, some of the implications here uh, when we spoke of God as the absolute moral standard? Uh, we refer primarily to God's existence in and of Himself, and as we spoke of God as the absolute judge, we're mainly focusing on His interactions with His creation. Uh, and at that at this point, then we want to look at, uh, at the fact that God's power and authority to judge, obligate his creatures to live according to the standard of his character. So we're obligated to live in a way that's consistent with his character because his character is the source, the ultimate judge of what is good and what is not good. Therefore, he has every right to judge our behavior based upon himself. And so 1 Peter 1, Peter says this, he says, As he who called you is holy... So be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy because I am holy. In other words, saying what we've just said uh, in a far more succinct way, but nonetheless, because He is who He is, He has every right to demand obedience, and therefore our call is to be holy as He is holy, for there is no other way to be holy than as He is holy. In other words, because God's the standard for all of human behavior, mankind is consequently obligated to obey and imitate God. We're meant to imitate God. Uh, and you find the same kind of thing said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. Jesus said, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is uh, perfect. Now, <clears throat> many people uh, are, who are confronted with God's sovereign authority and His righteous standard disregard God's commands and come up with rules for their own lives. They basically become laws unto themselves. And, uh, and some people who might believe that He has the power to judge does not mean He has the right to judge. Uh, and they may be, believe that it's honorable and good to resist God despite the consequences. Uh, it's like God is really like an evil dictator and I, we have every reason to want to disobey Him. Uh, you see this oftentimes even in Christian circles. In Christian circles. Uh, so, for example, many in the church uh, believe that because Jesus died for our sins, God no longer requires obedience. Therefore, it doesn't matter what we do. Once we uh, have been given the gift of forgiveness, we can go ahead and live, you know, according to our own sense of right or from sense of wrong, our own sense of morality or our own sense of our conscience, whatever that might be. Uh, <clears throat> and when people do that, they, they somehow confuse forgiveness with license. Forgiveness with license. Uh, they imagine that because their sins are forgiven, they can basically do whatever they think is right for them to do. Uh, however, and that would be, be kind of cool if that were true. <laughs> But uh, but it's uh, unfortunate. It's not true. Uh, so in truth, however, even believers have to live according to God's character, uh, and uh, it, it, that becomes a, a constant refrain in the New Testament. That uh, we've already alluded to this, but uh, but th there's no way to produce the fruit of the Spirit if you're living according to the flesh. And if you're a Christian, you can't live according to the flesh. So it's always going to be a battle between the flesh and the Spirit. And so the Spirit, which leads us to that which is reflective of God's character, demands that we conform ourselves to His image, not create an image that we like and then conform ourselves to that. Uh, and so listen to the way John put it in 1 John 7, 1, 7. He says, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, 
which is in fact what John is telling us is what we're we are doing or we should be doing. Uh, <clears throat> then he says, the blood of Jesus unpurifies us from all sin. In other words, walking in the light does not mean that we are without sin. That's why he says in 1 John 1, if we say we have no sin, we lie and the truth is not in us. Now that's what he says there. He says, if we, including himself, the truth is not in us, us, including himself. So John is saying, I don't lie about myself. I don't say I have no sin. I know I do have sin. If we say we have no sin, we're liars. Of course we have sin. But then he says, if we confess that sin, he's faithful and just to forgive that sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so here he's saying, if we walk in the light, which is what we're supposed to do, because He is light, then we constantly have the application of forgiveness from Jesus when we fall, when we sin, when we deviate from God's path or His instructed way. And, uh, and therefore, we will, we will because we're still sinners, but that does not mean that we are licensed to do that. That it's like, go ahead and worry about it. That's not the picture we get at all when you read 1 John, because you remember John says later in the epistle, a one who is born of God does not sin. Now what does that mean? Well, the word he uses there for sin, he uses in the present tense as a characteristic, and he, so he's basically saying one who's born of God does not live a life characterized by disobedience. That would be a contradiction of what you are. So if you're born of God, you don't go around doing the same things over and over and over again that are displeasing to God. That would prove you to be a liar, that you're not what you claim to be. Uh, because you're born of God. That means you have a new spirit within you, the Holy Spirit. You've got a new perspective. You have a new sensibility to God's character and His purpose. So those things are all changing now. You're no longer living for yourself. You're living for God. And so uh, that's a complete misunderstanding of what it means to be uh, a recipient of grace that would lead to a license, which would be a con inconsistent with the whole Bible let alone just the New Testament. So the Word, so God is the judge. He is the source of the standard. And His Word is the expression of that. And so to explore how God's Word is the revealed norm, we have to deal with three different issues. Do you ever notice how it's always in threes? 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 It's like the book of Revelation is always in cycles of sevens and sevens and sevens and sevens. And it's in threes and threes and threes. Okay, anyway. So uh, first of all, uh, let's look at the three categories of Revelation. Second, we'll look at the normative character of those three categories. And then lastly, we'll look at the unity of those three categories of revealed norms. So first of all, those three uh, categories. God's revealed Himself in three ways. Now, you, tr traditionally you won't see this, but I think it, it is a better way of looking at it. God is revealed in three ways. Traditionally, it's usually seen as uh, two. Two ways, that is special and general, but we need to, I think it's, it is appropriate to add a third way, which is we're calling an existential way. So there's special revelation, general revelation, and then there also, we'll also see that there is existential revelation, that is through the person, through the individual. Uh, special revelation uh, is usually uh, associated with uh, the uh, direct communication from God in Scripture. Uh, in prophecy, in the dreams and visions recorded for us in the Bible. Uh, general revelation is generally that which includes history, uh, the universe itself, weather, plants, animals, human beings. Uh, general revelation is kind of a catch-all category to hold everything that's not considered special. But, uh, <clears throat> uh, and that's a helpful, I think, uh, definition or, or distinctions, general and special, special and general. Uh, but, uh, but I think it's helpful also to sort of break apart part of that second general revelation and look at that part of it which we might refer to as existential revelation and that is his revelation in persons, in persons that's uh, oftentimes grouped together with general revelation but it probably would be better served, treated separately. 
Uh, and so, first of all, the normative aspects found in general revelation, the normative aspects of God's Word found in general revelation, and then the norms of special, and then the third, existential. So let's look first at God's general revelation as an authority over us. Uh, when we speak of general revelation, uh, we're really concerned with the way creation and history tell us true things about God and His moral requirements uh, of us. The way creation and history tell us true things about God and His moral requirement for us. Uh, the Bible assures us, it assures us, yes, that we are fallen. We are broken creatures. We have fallen uh, in terms of the sin of our first parents is now a part of the fabric of who we are and everything else. Uh, it, it assures us, though, that general revelation still speaks clearly enough to teach us true things about God. Uh, it reveals the perfect standard of God's character and serves as one of His revealed norms. Uh, two important features of that uh, as it applies to Christian ethics, and that is, first, it's complex, and secondly, it's important. It's complex. In the first place, general revelation is complex. It's complex. Not simple, but complex. Uh, it's common for Christians uh, to think about general revelation in simple terms, uh, as if every form of general revelation were the same. In real reality, however, there are varying degrees of generalness and specialness within the category of general revelation. Uh, some of the aspects of general revelation are common to everyone, whereas others are restricted to limited groups of people. Well, we're going to explain what we mean by that. But some aspects are rather vague, whereas others are particularly clear. Some aspects follow the natural order with a really relatively little indication of God's active involvement, where others demonstrate His supernatural intervention. So, for example, if you take one end of the spectrum, uh, the widely viewed general revelation of the sun, you know, the sun in the sky, something you haven't seen for the last three or four days here in Latvia. There was a... Today? Yeah. Yeah, for a few minutes I saw it. Yeah, I did for a few minutes and then I blinked and it was gone. I don't know what happened. Well, anyway, uh, the uh, if you take the sun, for example, uh, one of those that we generally ignore because it doesn't reflect a pardon the word reflect, it doesn't suggest some special intervention on the part of God, but it's there all the time and you think, okay, so not everyone, nearly everyone in history uh, uh, has seen the sun and its effects, right? Of course you have. Uh, and in the sun, they have seen God's self-revelation. That's right. Uh, that's uh, probably the most general type of general revelation you can imagine. But then think about it, consider that when you see the sun and you see the effects of the sun, uh, we're obligated to a specific ethical response. Yeah. Uh, Jesus mentions this in Matthew 5, 44 and 45. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. In other words, the fact that the sun rises on evil people, warms evil people, causes their crops to grow, places a moral obligation on them to acknowledge Him that they didn't make the sun, <laughs> they didn't create it, okay, where did it come from? Well, it just appeared in the Big Bang somewhere, there was a sun that came out of it, whatever. Uh, which, of course, is not what God is doing. He's trying to tell us something by that. He's telling us that He has providential designs over things. And those providential designs lead and draw our attention to Him as the providential designer. That's what the whole point is. That you look up and you go, wow, that's amazing, isn't it? That's just not an accidental phenomenon. There's something sort of 
designed about all this. It, the heat, the sun, the nitrogen, and all these things that cause food for plants and all this other kind of stuff. Uh, and so, since all human beings then are responsible to imitate the character of God, we're supposed to then love and pray for our enemies. In other words, generally, they are the beneficiaries of this. They don't give him the, the uh, response he deserves. So we pray for these people. I pray for my neighbor who doesn't respond to God's acts of creation and providence the way he designed them to pr promote a response. And I pray for my enemies. I pray that they would see the sun for the first time in their lives and go, wow, you know, this, this something pretty big made that. Bigger than me, bigger than anything I can see. Well, that's a different response than the kind you get from most people who just find another way of explaining it. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, some general revelation is known by so few people that it appears almost like special revelation. For example, uh, if you consider the history, the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, this is a part of general revelation. That's right, general revelation. Uh, history is a part of general revelation. I, I keep telling them not to call me. I don't know why they keep calling here. I don't even have a phone, in fact. How did that happen? Uh, as, in other words, as we see these events, God allows, as He allows them, He also governs the world through time. We learn a lot about Him. And the history of salvation, particularly Christ, tells us a lot about God, ourselves, and salvation. Now listen to what Paul says in Acts 17. Here he's talking to a bunch of Athenians who don't believe in the true God. He says, In the past God overlooked such ignorance, theirs, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent. For He has set a day when He will judge the world with justice by the man He has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising Him from the dead. Now, it's interesting if you think about what Paul is saying there, because uh, he has no reason to believe that anyone in Athens had taken a trip to Jerusalem, right? Got there, Feast of Tabernacles. But he's appealing to something that is what he considers to be a fact of common revelation, common knowledge. Okay? Not, they didn't get it from heaven somewhere. Just common knowledge. In other words, the fact that uh, the historical resurrection of Jesus was proof that God had set someone to judge the world and that the coming day of judgment obligates people everywhere to repent. In other words, the general revelation of the historical fact of the resurrection of Christ obligates everybody. Everybody's obligated by that general historical revelation of redemption that is in Christ. What about importance? Well, in the second place, Christian ethics, we need to affirm the importance of general revelation in making ethical decisions. God holds everyone accountable to recognize and to conform to those aspects of His character that are revealed through creation and history. So, even though we rightly exalt Scripture, which we should, as the supreme form of revelation, uh, Protestants, like ourselves, have always affirmed the validity and binding authority of general revelation. For example, in the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1, section 1, it begins with these words, "...the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men unexcusable. Yet are they not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and of His will which is necessary unto salvation." Paul says this in Romans 1. He says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that all men are without excuse." So the person you pass on the street is not an innocent. Cafe innocent. He's not an innocent, okay? And in fact, he ignores what is ever present to him every day constantly by suppressing that knowledge, which is speaking to him from the heavens every day, 
by substituting something for this God they're confronted by every day. So they make a God in their own image, make a God that's more comfortable for them, make a God that's more pleasing to them. And that's exactly what Paul is describing in Romans chapter 1. And that comes out in verse 32 where he talks about those who reject God as he reveals himself through what he's made. He says, they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death. Deserve death. Why do you think that everybody, everybody, everywhere, deep down inside, fears death? Because they know they're going to die. Do you know anybody who isn't dying or aren't going to die? Do you know anybody? Is anybody in this room not going to die? I think we're all going to die, right? I think we are. I think I'm pretty confident that we're all going to die. Okay, unless Jesus comes back, which I have no reason to believe he will before I die. I think, and I'm probably the oldest person in the room. I'll die first, okay? I'm happy to go before the rest of you. I'm happy to go before the rest of you. But that is a simple fact. And everybody on the street out there knows they're dying. So what are they going to do about it? Deny it. Live in denial of it. That's what uh, Ernest Becker's class, famous book, The Denial of Death. People figure out all sorts of strategies to deny the most obvious thing in the world. You walk by a hospital, what's going on? People are sick. Why are they sick? They're dying. Don't you get it? They're all dying. We're all dying. So what are we going to do about it? Ignore it. Suppress it. Get drunk. Have a party. Whatever. Eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die, okay? So everybody you see out there knows they're dying. And they're all embarked on a strategy to live in denial of it. Because it's too painful to accept the reality of it. I mean, it, right? I mean, that's the way it is. So... Uh, that's what Paul is saying. He says they know His righteous decree. In other words, they feel guilty and they cover it up as much as they can. They singe their consciences as much as they can. How do you do that? You hang out with people who do the same thing you do. And everybody feels better about being, being fools. So what does a drunk do? A drunk looks for somebody else to get drunk with them. Right? Drunks like drunks. There's fellowship in drunkenness, right? So we can all get drunk together. It's great. It's wonderful. We can all be blurry-eyed and not face reality. It feels good. A, a drunk by himself is constantly confronted with sober people. It makes him sick. <laughs> you know, I want to be with people who are drunk, not with sober people. So this is what Paul is saying. They already know and they know everything they're doing by ignoring God and His revelation to them through the skies, through the heavens, through, through just, the, just beauty. Just seeing beauty is a convicting thing because you don't have it. I mean, every time you look at a sunset, you go, that's beauty. And you look in the mirror and you go, that's ugly. I mean, really. That's the whole point. That you're confronted and surrounded by all this beauty and you run from it. You don't want it because it reminds you that you're not beautiful. And that you really deserve something really bad. Because deep down inside you know you're really not a very good person. He says, they, those who do such things, they know they deserve death. Wow. So Paul's calling general revelation like that a decree. A decree of God. Uh, sometimes it's called an ordinance, sometimes it's called a judgment, but the idea is the same. General revelation is a revealed standard that's obvious to everyone and that God commands everyone to obey. There is no one who has an excuse. They are without excuse. That's tough. So many people disagree with Paul, of course. <clears throat> And some of us, no doubt, feel that we have not learned these things from creation uh, and that this information is too specific to be gathered from nature and history. And Paul confronted the same people in his day who believed that. So he includes in the discussion of why many people don't understand these facts from general revelation. So Paul already anticipated that. You could say God through Paul already anticipated that. Because in Romans 1.21 he says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified God nor gave God thanks, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. So they look for various strategies to avoid the truth. And so that's the futility he talks about there, the foolishness of things. Uh, so there's a great little book on a, a kind of an apologetic kind of book. Uh, 
by uh, Oz Guinness called In Praise of Folly, which is basically taking a title from Erasmus, but nonetheless, that how modern culture is the praise of folly, it's the praise of foolishness. And you can sort of chronicle that through all the things that we engage in as cultures uh, that are distractions by design uh, to lead us away from the obvious truth of things. So Paul's saying that even though general revelation speaks clearly, we reject its obvious meaning in favor of something else. And so what did the ancients do? Well, in Athens, they built idols. They made temples. They, you know, there, was, there were more. It's, it's a stated fact that there were more idols in Athens than people. The population of Athens at the time when Paul wrote and God gave his speech was about 10,000. But the population of idols was in the hundreds of thousands. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if you walked out the door tonight and there was an idol every three feet? You know, all kinds of weird stone, wood things. You would be literally almost like tripping over them. That's how many there were. So when Paul went to Athens, it says he looked around and saw all these idols, and it says his spirit was provoked within him. You know, literally, it says he was outraged. Can you imagine? Look at all this junk. <laughs> these people, what are they doing? That's why he was so furious with them, that it was so stupid that they were believing such a foolish, futile lie. And they seemed happy-go-lucky about it. it. Made him angry. And so, um, and many Christians have become accustomed to think about the creation through the eyes of modern unbelief. So, Nevertheless, God's revelation in creation is still binding. It's still His revealed standard to which we must conform. It seems that Paul was probably drawing from Psalm 19, where David wrote this in verse 1, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of His hands. They are proclaiming. The, sh the, the creation shouts this. It shouts it. It screams it out at us. And that just shows you how dull of hearing and vision we have become. Of course, not just we, but obviously for the last, you know, 3,000, 4,000 years. Anyway, so then you get from general revelation to special revelation, special revelation. And uh, so just as we did there with uh, general, with special, we want to look at its complexity as well and its importance. So first, the, the complexity of special revelation. In the first place, special revelation is complicated, it's complex, if you will, because it comes to us in a number of different forms. It comes to us in a number of different forms. And most of those forms rely on written or spoken words, but all of them involve God communicating with people in ways that transcend the normal workings of creation. So as you survey lit uh, Scripture, you find different examples of special revelation. Uh, in some cases, God appears visibly. He speaks audibly to an individual or to a group. And in other cases, you hear His voice, but you don't see Him. Uh, and other times, He communicates through a mediator. He talks through an angel who appears to people. Or He commonly instructs those who have received His revelation to write it down and pass it on. And that written record is counted as His Word, originally delivered, which is a form of special revelation. Now, as varied as these different types of special revelation are, they're still special in the sense that they represent extraordinary, supernatural, if you will, communication between God and man. And they involve, in effect, God interrupting the natural course of events to communicate directly with us, with His people. And even though these various types of revelation share that common bond, we can distinguish between some of them because some of them come are more directly from God with less mediation. And those that come through more distant mediation are the least special. And we can even think about them as bordering between general and special revelation. So those that come more directly from God are the most special. So for example, Moses spoke with God directly and personally. And you read Exodus 33, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. She can Moses pretty cool relationship there with God. He spoke with Moses as a man would speak with his friend. Boy. 
Yeah, who was the humblest man who ever lived other than Jesus? Anybody know? Mm -hmm. Well, the Bible says Moses was the humblest man who ever walked the earth. And you can see why. He spoke to God like a friend. That's humbling, buddy. You can imagine. On the other end of the spectrum of special revelation, you find things like dreams and, uh, and things like that. And the significance of special revelation in dreams lies not in the fact that the person dreams, but in the fact that God uses that to communicate truth. He uses a dream to communicate truth. So, for example, in Genesis 41, we find the account of Pharaoh's dream of the seven lean cows that ate the seven fat cows. Remember that one? Yeah, certainly Pharaoh knew that the dream was supernatural, uh, and that's proven by his appeal to counselors to interpret it for him. But how did Pharaoh know his dream was uh, supernatural? How did he know it was supernatural? A God didn't directly address Pharaoh in a dream, he even, or even even sent an angel to speak to him, as he later did for Joseph. Uh, the only thing special about Pharaoh's dream was that God used it to communicate to Pharaoh. And apart from God's use of the dream, that revelation would have been indistinguishable from dreams that occur as a part of normal, normal part of general revelation. In short, some special revelation is fantastic and obviously supernatural, uh, such as his manifest presence with people like Moses. Another special revelation closely resembles normal, natural human life. Uh, in our day, the most common form of special revelation is Scripture. And even Scripture has parts that are very special and other parts that are pretty common. For example, according to Exodus 31, God directly wrote the Ten Commandments, the finger of God, right? Directly wrote the Ten Commandments. And those were contained on tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God, right? Mm-hmm. Other texts, however, were originally written by pagans who interpreted general revelation. Take, for example, Acts 17. Paul spoke these words to his Greek audience. As some of your own poets have said, we are God's offspring. And there Paul's doing what? He's confirming or affirming the conclusions of a pagan poet. And thereby that pagan poet's words become part of special revelation. You find it in the Old Testament as well, where certain, certain people are cited who are not Christian or not even Jewish or not followers of God, but they once they're used, they become part of the special revelation of Scripture itself. Uh, other more common texts include, include certain proverbs collected by biblical writers, other quotes from pagan poets, Copies of letters between King Artaxerxes of Persia and his servants of, uh, in the Trans-Euphrates region can be found in Ezra 4. They weren't, they weren't followers of Yahweh. Special revelation is complex. It comes to us in a number of forms, and most of those forms rely on spoken or written words. But all of them involve God communicating with people in ways that transcend the normal workings of creation. So what is the importance then? All special revelation is important to Christian ethics because all special revelation is normative for us. All special revelation is a standard to which we are called to adhere. So for example, after Paul quoted the pagan poets, Eratus and Cleanthes in Acts 17, he went on to draw an application from their words that is binding on all mankind, Acts 17. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. So he makes an application based on the quote of a poet, a poet, Eratus and Cleanthes. And so the, despite the pagan origin, we are his offspring, Paul uses them as God's authoritative apostle turned his quote into special revelation to mankind and made it a binding statement obliging everyone everywhere to repent. And even if the words of pagan origin carry such force, certainly revelation that's more special obligates, obligates us even more. And you see that affirmed by Scripture itself. For example, Listen to what God told the inhabitants of Jerusalem in Jeremiah 25. After they re repeatedly rejected His prophets, He zeroes in. Because you have not listened to My words, I will summon all the peoples of the north and My servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. 
and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all the surrounding nations. I will completely destroy them and make them an object of horror and scorn and an everlasting ruin. So because they had refused to listen to the prophets, he threatens extreme covenantal judgment, warning them that he would bring everlasting ruin if they failed to repent. And when God reveals truth through His authoritative representatives, such as prophets and apostles, it is absolutely binding. Well, what about existential revelation? Okay, special, general special existential revelation. Well, although it's not been common, I think, for people to talk about this, I think it does, uh, the idea that God reveals Himself in and through people uh, has always been recognized throughout Protestant theology as a kind of general revelation. In other words, here we're not talking about a new kind of revelation, just simply a different way of talking about it from previous times. So that, for example, in the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1, section 10, the supreme judge by which all controversies of religion are to be determined, all decrees of councils, opinions of ancient writers, doctrines of men, and private spirits are to be examined, and in whose sentence we are to rest can be no other but the Holy Spirit speaking in the Scriptures. So, in other words, the supreme judge in every controversy of religion is the Spirit, and the surest guide to the Spirit is what He's revealed to us in the Scriptures. So if you want to know what the Holy Spirit thinks, well, look at what He wrote, or look what He inspired to be written. And that's the Scripture. Uh, notice that in appealing to Scripture, though, as the ultimate standard, the confession doesn't simply brush aside these others as useless or invalid. In fact, the confession assumes the value of all these other sources that it lists. He uses councils, so we have creeds, okay, ancient writers, St. Augustine, <laughs> doctrines of men, private spirits to reveal his will to people, even though their determinations have to be subject to Scripture. So people who say, no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible, are missing something here. Okay? God has spoken through other means to confirm and affirm his written word, and this is the way he often does it. And it's a valid thing to do. And that's why when I quote the Westminster Confession, I'm not saying it's the Bible, but it affirms everything that's in the Bible. And that's the point. In a succinct manner, it tells me what the Bible's telling me, only without all the various books of the Bible. And so these human judgments are forms of existential revelation. None is a, a simple presentation of history or creation known as a direct supernatural communication from God. They involve God's revelation through human beings, whether as joint conclusions theologically reached by groups, or as judgments of individuals, or as the inward leading and illumination of the Holy Spirit within believers. So, uh, so uh, and this is important to remember, because sometimes you'll be talking, and you say, well, you know, St. Augustine said this or that, and they go, I don't care what St. Augustine, what does the Bible say? Well, wait a minute, you know, God speaks through people to clarify things for us. I mean, it doesn't mean they're, 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 they're not ever wrong, but they're worth of consideration, and then measure what they say according to the Bible. Can you show that they got it wrong? I mean, if you can, fine, we'll throw it away. But, but uh, that, uh, that very narrow view of revelation that keeps all these other things completely outside the circle of conversation is, I think, a, a misunderstanding, a misunderstanding of things. Uh, and so <clears throat> it is complex and it is important. And in the first place, it can be divided into two main categories, external aspects and internal aspects. The ex external aspects of existential revelation and the internal aspects. What do we mean by external aspects? Well, that would include such things as human existence, human judgment, individual and corporate behavior. Uh, you can think of human existence as a form of revelation because human beings are created in the image of God. So in some sense, we're each a replica or a reflection of God. Human beings are the images that reflect God's glory and dignity. And because we do that, we learn things about God by how? Looking at people. I learn a lot about God by looking at you and seeing your complexity. 
All the things that are about you, the way you feel things, the way you see things, the way you articulate things, all of that tells me that you were made in the image of God. So there's something about the way you are that helps me better understand what God, why he made you the way he made you, and what that tells me about God. Uh, it's a very important thing to do. A uh, second thing is that the individual and corporate human judgment is a form of existential revelation. And that's related to the fact that we're created in God's image. Uh, listen to the way Moses recorded the history of creation of mankind in Genesis 1. He says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image and our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so we can draw inferences from the fact that we're made in the image of God uh, when we first see the idea in Scripture and the meaning associated when He delegates authority to man to apply the things given to man by virtue of His creation to rule over the world. And one of those implications is that when human beings exercise authority, they're revealing God's character. So that's why when someone will say, the, the, the first image of God your child has is found where? In the parent. Right? You think that's an accident? That's a part of the design. God's telling me, look, what you know about God is often revealed initially through the way your parents reflect God. They have authority, don't they? God has authority, absolute authority, right? And so as you learn these things about your parents that are reflections of their own image of God and their, their ro role in living out under God's authority, exerting their authority, you find that there's something beautiful about authority. There's something good about it. Or not, depending on how your parents actually operate based on that. But that's an ideal way. That's what they're meant to do. Uh, <clears throat> just like you're meant to understand the beauty of the body of Christ by experiencing the beauty of the body of the human family. Most people have the biggest problem with church who have the biggest problems in their family. Because the only image they have of family is bad. And they look at the church, my new brothers and sisters, oh gosh, they're just like my real brothers and sisters, they're not really very good. So, so, so the family becomes a little microcosm of what the body of Christ is meant to be. So you want that to be a positive thing, uplifting thing, a revealing thing of who God is and what He's about. Uh, and it reveals His character in the process. Another way you can see that at work is Genesis 2. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. And that's the first example in Scripture of man exercising authority given to him by God to name the creation, name the animals. And whatever else you want to say about that, it's at least true that when Adam named the animals, he was thinking and exercising judgment. So it's fair to say that when humans think and judge, it's an exercise of a divinely delegated authority. We're reflecting His character. And that's exactly what we see in the Westminster Confession of Faith when it talks about councils, ancient writers, doctrines of men, and private spirits. You see that reflected in Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council. What does Paul do? He goes and submits himself to the authority of the council. Tell me what you think I should do. Because God uses such structures, such councils, to communicate His will and His authority. He uses them. And, and so, <clears throat> in the church, the elders are granted certain authority delegated by God. And so, my submission to them is tantamount to my submission to God. And if I can't submit to them, how am I going to submit to God? And you go, yeah, but they're all fallen. Yeah, so what? Of course they are. They acknowledge it. Uh, and they're not supreme because God's Word is supreme. But anyway, Paul did that in Acts 15 and, uh, and to determine how he should relate to Gentile Christians, whether they should be forced to submit to the requirements of the law of Moses or not. And it included this. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. Notice what it says. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit in other words, they're listening to the, the Spirit's prompting and to us, that is, as men, not to burden you with anything beyond the following. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. And so they were uh, speaking 
for themselves as well as for the Holy Spirit. Okay, so there it is. It's not just the Bible. It's a, the Spirit's working through the council to achieve his objectives. And that, not infallibly, but nonetheless, delegated authority. Uh, and so the same is true when a church meets in a smaller group. Look at the words of Jesus in Matthew 18. Every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. So <clears throat> there you have again the delegated authority that's used by God to reveal His will to His people that is not simply the special revelation of the Bible. It, there it is. And uh, that's existential revelation. God speaking to us through people. And that's something that's very important to observe. So in 1 Thessalonians, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, and so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. And so imitating Paul or Barnabas or Peter or all these other people is tantamount to imitating God himself. That's how he's delegated that communication to be transmitted to us. We're going to stop there. It's a little after nine and uh, before we get to the next section. So anyway... Uh, let me close us with prayer. Father, we thank you for this, uh, this evening and for these uh, uh, deep words of yours, these uh, deep truths that come from your word. We ask that you would give us clarity of mind and understanding as we seek to understand the, the way you reveal yourself and the way that revelation obligates us to obedience and that uh, the things that we may not have ever thought of before or even considered before, that we might be open to your spirit, that we might listen and understand the things of you that are important and that are necessary for us to be better stewards of your grace as we walk in this world and as we serve your church. We ask that you would do this again to your own praise and to your own glory, uh, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.